Uh, so first, I'm just going to let everybody up on the panel here introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Meredith Rose. I'm senior policy counsel at a group called Public Knowledge. We are a Washington, D.C.-based consumer advocacy organization working on a wide range of digital rights issues, um, everything from net neutrality to privacy to antitrust to copyright and entertainment. Um, and I literally just wrote a gigantic paper on exactly this question. So I like maybe bullied Scott a little bit into making this a panel. Uh, and I will be moderating today. So if I go down the line. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my name is Andrew Greenberg. I give a lot of the reverb into our audio, apparently. Uh, so I am the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association. We work with a lot of audio folks. A lot of our folks uh, have their soundtracks up on streaming services, but that's not why I'm on the panel. I'm on the panel because I'm the chair of the DeKalb County Film, Music, and Digital Entertainment Commission, as well as on the State Advisory Board for Film, Music, and Digital Entertainment, and obviously dealing with music uh, and the, the interesting issues in the music industry has been a core question for us and we actually have good outposts here for pandora amazon music and so forth in georgia you always think of them as on the other coast but in fact they are very active here uh i'm matthew lane uh he him i am senior policy counsel at fight for the future uh we are a uh queer women and artists led uh internet rights activist organization and uh, I don't want to steal too much thunder for Leah, so she can go past the veto. <laughs> uh, yeah, Leah Holland, uh, they, she, not precious about it. And I am the campaigns and comms director at Fight for the Future. Uh, and I also, where I focus a fair amount on creative rights, um, authors and musicians often specifically, and uh, doing a bit of organizing uh to fight for better ones because that um creatives desperately need i come from a first career in the entertainment industry working in artist management um distribution music festivals concert tours that sort of thing uh and have watched firsthand as the options for artists to make a dignified living erode and erode and erode also um myself being an author excellent um, so I think we're going to keep this kind of free flowing. Um, I did, however, want to start off a little bit with answering what we actually do know about where the money goes. Um, and we do know some. Um, we know some because it has been publicly reported um, a lot through earnings statements uh, and uh, a whole lot more has been left out. So generally, we got some top line numbers here. Um, before we even actually get into that, let's talk about who the players are when we talk about streaming music. So. I start off as a consumer. I toss my 10 bucks a month to Spotify. It's more than that now. They jacked up the rate. Hmm. Um, but just let's make up a number. I toss my 10 bucks a month to Spotify. This is the theoretical chain of payment. Spotify then turns around, takes the money, pays it to rights holders. Now, in the case of music, that's two sets of rights holders because music, copyright for historical reasons, is very precious. Um, there are two rights holders for music. There is the rights holder that owns the rights to the underlying composition of the song. So that is songwriters and publishers. Then there are the folks who own the rights to the actual recording that is being played. And those are uh, recording artists and mo mostly major record labels. Those two groups then turn around and take the money that they have gotten from the streaming service, and then they are responsible for paying it out to the artists. Now, a lot of it goes into one end of this pipeline, and very little of it comes out the other end in artists' pockets. Um, and so I got a lot of questions uh, several years ago. I was working on the Hill on this bill uh, called the Music Modernization Act. And the question I kept getting over and over again from staffers was like, where is all the money going exactly if it's not going to artists? So top line numbers, what we do know. Um, we do know that streaming services take in from customers about $12 billion per year. Now, when we talk about streaming services, we are mostly talking about Spotify, Apple Music, um, Amazon Music, Google Play, YouTube counts as one of those, um, especially YouTube Music, but that's a little more opaque. Um, and sort of the big ones, Tidal is, I think, not even big enough to be counted among the top 10 globally, things like Tencent, there's some Chinese players in there as well. But generally, for the purposes of the discussion, think... Spotify, which is the independent one, the only independent one, really. And then uh, then you've got Amazon, Apple, Google. So you get about $12 million comes into that part of the ecosystem. Um, those streaming services keep about 
Now, 30% is a number that has been, uh, is actually a shocking point of agreement among most of the music ecosystem, which is, this is an okay number, actually. Rights holders are fine with 30%. 30% um, as like a cut dates all the way back to the earliest days of the Apple iTunes store, back when it was still a la carte. I have a 99 cent song, about 30 cents of that went to Apple. That was an early deal that was hashed out and it's been the industry standard ever since. So streaming services keep about 30% of that. So they keep uh, about just a little under 4 billion. Um, the streaming services then pay the remaining money, which is 8.28 billion is paid to rights holders. And that's where we lose sight of what's happening. Um, we have a couple of points of transparency. We can have a rough idea um, of some sort of songwriters organizations that handle a particular license, um, have some transparency into how much they pay artists uh, because they are under consent decrees from being sued in the early half of the 20th century. So they have to be transparent about their payment processes. They're really the only ones. Uh, everything else is a black box. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, and just as, as context to sort of inform the rest of the discussion, um, you notice earlier when I was talking about streaming services, I said the real big ones, Spotify, Apple Music, Google, Amazon Music. You will notice the three of those four have something in common, which is they are loss leaders for some of the biggest corporations in the history of mankind, um, like East India company scale, large companies. Um, they're considered loss leaders, which is the fancy economic word for we lose money on this service, but it brings people into our ecosystem. So we're going to keep throwing money down the hole after it. Um, so if Amazon, Apple, Google lose money on a music streaming service, that's fine. They don't care. They have a Scrooge McDuck pool of money <laughs> and they can continue to pour it down the bottomless pit. Uh, Spotify, on the other hand, is not backed by a giant multinational beh tech behemoth. Um, and so they're an interesting case study in what this market looks like when you don't have infinite pools of money basically to pour after it. Um, Spotify has turned a profit exactly two quarters in its entire history. It's been around since about 2007. Um, both times it was widely regarded as an accounting error that was reversed <laughs> in the next quarter. Um, so Spotify has never turned a profit. Now they are, there's a lot of reasons for this. The big one is the way that music licensing negotiations are structured. The super short version for the purposes of this panel is that record labels are the part of the equation on the music side that are totally unregulated. They are complete free market actors. They can charge as much as they want. And so typically the negotiations go something like this. Spotify comes in and says, hey, uh, we took in a, a, a billion dollars of revenue last year. And uh, Sony will say, cool, um, I'm going to charge you $1.3 billion uh, for my money, uh, for my music. Um, and this keeps them sort of in a, a sustainable debt cycle, essentially. Uh, now, Spotify only has so much money. They want to minimize the amount of cash that they're paying out. So they want to get as much as they can while, you know, basically not having to actually shell out cash. But they've got other things they can offer. They can offer things like uh, discounted ad revenue, uh, discounted ad costs. Um, so, you know, if Sony wants to place ads with them, they can get it at a, at a discount. Um, they offer things like prime playlist placement. So on all the, like today's top hits and all of the really, really big Spotify playlists, they can give prime placement to musicians from the record label they're negotiating with. Um, they offer algorithmic juicing, which like researchers have actually figured this out that um, I think it's universal is represented something like three or four times more frequently in the algorithm than any other record label. Uh, and they'll deny this, uh, but it's it's been, researchers have very firmly settled, yeah, there is a disproportionate representation of some of these labels. Um, and so this is great for Spotify because Spotify can offer these things without having to actually write a check for them. Like they can pay them out and that means they can stay afloat because again, they're not making enough money to meet the financial demands of these deals. The reason record labels like this is because labels have contracts with their artists that require them to pay down a portion of any cash that they make on licensing deals. They do not have to pass any of the value of these non-cash components of the deals down to artists. And so what we are seeing, which most of these deals are under non-disclosure agreements or NDAs. So no exaggeration, the number of people who are legally allowed to look at the contract between Spotify and Sony Music, I can count on one hand. Um, that's it. Who are even allowed to lay eyes upon it in the world. 
Um, but we do have some reporting. There are leaked deals. Uh, the 2017 contract between Sony and Spotify was leaked to much fanfare. Um, and so you can get a sense of what these deals look like. Um, but yeah, essentially you've got this situation where record labels really like it because it minimizes the amount of money they have to turn around and pay out to their artists. And so we've seen this situation where like, you know, Taylor Swift uses her platform as one of the biggest artists in the world to call out low streaming payments. Um, and that's great for her because she's still making millions of dollars. Uh, but you have to, I don't remember what the, what the stream count was to make a penny on Spotify. It's large. Um, and basically what you have is the system where everybody's kind of in the dark and the incentives for the two biggest players who are making these deals that determine the fate of everybody else in the ecosystem are completely skewed. Um, record labels actually have a disincentive to paying their artists. If they can avoid it, they will. Um, and streaming services have a disincentive against paying money that could go to artists. Um, and so we've ended up in this sort of like weird perverse situation where, you know, uh, some of the most popular artists on Spotify aren't seeing royalty checks. Um, now that Andrew, you look like you wanted to add something. Well, I was going to uh, actually throw some stuff out here because I think this is important for us as consumers uh, because not paying artists means we're not going to get the content we want. But I'd love to get a better sense of you all. How many of you listen via streaming services? I'll admit I'm on Pandora. But uh, all right. So who uses Spotify? Excellent. Google Music, Apple Music, Pandora. Uh, WhatsApp is now doing it. That's a new version where they're paying uh, not just per song, but paying based on ad revenue. All right. How many of you have content up there that is streaming? All right. Uh, do you mind saying where loudly? What yeah, what yeah. platform do you stream your content on? All the above. Nice. And over here? Mm -hmm. All right. So I was going to ask how you got it up there. So, yeah, so you go through a service to do that. And you have him back? Yeah, no, SoundCloud counts. SoundCloud is actually like a really interesting side example that we can talk about in a bit because um, they they do not go through the same payment structure that uh, the major streaming services do. And you're insulated because you go through the distributor on this, but do you have a preference as as artist? I know who my friend's preferences are, but do you have preferences? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Are you on title as well? <laughs> All right, title's in it. Barrett had some great insights on title we were talking before. But I thought now that he's copying, we should turn it over to Matthew. Hey, Matt. <laughs> to, uh, share his. Yeah. So his friends up there as well, and they talk about how much, I mean, they're not making a lot per, but they, it, is a, it has become a significant part of their revenue stream, the amount that they have up there. Though one of my friends <laughs> does better putting up content on YouTube directly uh, rather than Google Music. Putting, and YouTube has been a better resource for him to make money because, I mean, he doesn't have, he's got fun visuals in his stuff, but people just put that on loop, on his stuff on loop. So he's got one hour thing that people just loop and loop and loop, being interrupted by ads and he's making money throughout. So now that you're, uh, <laughs> now that you're healthy again. Uh, yeah, so I come at this um, from a background in competition IP and how they intersect. So. Meredith and I have worked together <clears throat> sorry, on some of this stuff, and that's how we know each other. But um, actually, sorry, can Leah, can you go first? Yeah, I can totally go first. I timed that right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I come at this largely from an organizing perspective where uh, we at fight for the future we have a lot of of musicians authors etc working for us and uh, a lot of a lot of friends who rely on um the uh on, on these industries to pay rent and buy groceries uh which is becoming extraordinarily difficult <laughs> to to do as uh especially in the post-covid era i think the statistic is it's something like even 
touring, which was the big money maker, supposedly pre COVID, um, because music is worthless now, despite the fact that Daniel Eek is making more this year than Taylor Swift ever has on Spotify. Um, that it's just become extraordinarily um, difficult to pull money in through touring as well because costs have ballooned. Um, many artists, uh, mid mid level artists, to some big names like I think Lord has done a really great job of speaking out a lot on this. Are actually losing money on touring now too, and um, and there just seems to be very few paths to actually be a full time working artist, which is very exclusionary when it comes to new players. When it comes to any any sort of diverse artist who may not. Like, like you can be an artist and have a good life if you've got like rich parents you know, like <laughs> at, 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 at this point or or if you are incredibly lucky and you work very 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 hard uh and we don't like that um in the slightest and so we partner with organizations like united musicians and allied workers uh, to support their campaigns, and they have some really great legislation uh, that that they've had introduced this year to to try to combat streaming specifically. And then we've also seen the um, Biden administration take action against monopoly <laughs> Ticketmaster, Live Nation monopolies on venues, and uh, and there's just never been, I think, more resources or ability to coordinate amongst the different arts communities that are all experiencing this lack of alignment of incentives between the organizations that purport to represent them and wield the hammer of owning so much IP and the power that that grants and say that they're speaking on behalf of artists and very clearly from what Meredith <laughs> just laid out for us, they, they are they're acting in the interest of maybe the chosen few, but often uh, just in the interest of, of, of back catalogs of, of artists that aren't even alive and leveraging everything to the max so that they can pay out to to shareholders who are not artists and who um, aren't the ones that are struggling to put groceries on the table at this point. Uh, and it's it's extraordinarily frustrating and also some of the like best smartest most well-spoken and powerful people that i've ever met are <laughs> actively advocating on these issues amidst trying to make their art and make a living making their art and uh and it's a really inspiring thing to get to work on it's one of my favorite parts of parts of my job so good stuff we can get more into legislation later yeah, maybe talk mm -hmm. competition yeah, yeah. So, yeah competition so um so my my perspective on this is is largely through a competition lens and um most of the industry is dominated by a big three um unfortunately streaming kind of ruins that a little bit for me but like when you get down to three companies that's usually what we would consider oligopoly mm -hmm. territory meaning that like there are companies that coordinate with each other um and just to be clear the big three are record labels in uh musical works there are uh the big three uh publishers ascap bmi csac sound recordings uh big three umg sony warner and for streaming the big four spotify apple youtube amazon which was covered um and so uh not all of those are for-profit entities um so i'll just put a pin on that for a second but just to explain a little bit about how competition works uh there's a thing that we call tacit collusion and on its own, it is not illegal under the monopoly laws. What that means is that if companies aren't directly communicating or coordinating with each other, but they're just kind of looking to see what each other does, um, that can be legal, unfortunately. So you see, you can see price following, you could see following with contracts, you could see other things. Uh, there's also issues with like venues for information sharing. And again, if they have smart competition lawyers, they can avoid pitfalls from uh, getting in trouble for that too. So there are ways to signal to each other what they're about to do um, that, that might not run afoul from antitrust laws. And so um, when you get down to around three companies, that's when you get to a territory where it becomes easier to do those things, to do signaling, to do... Um, this sort of like watching what each other does and 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 following each other 
And so across the industry, everyone at the sort of like user interface level through the middle is, is greatly consolidated on the other side with artists. And as a, a music nerd, like I, I love that there's like suddenly a huge amount of, uh, competition, you know, quote unquote, but like a proliferation of artists, uh, people who make great music and that, that get, uh, that I've access to, uh, through these services. Uh, and uh they are technically you know in competition with each other but um but it also means that with this big diversity of artists they have a lot less power and so there's a huge power imbalance between the artists and everyone else and so you can see a lot of things like take it or leave it contracts uh you know we'll pay you what we pay you and and other things that they really have no say over uh unless they're like super famous like taylor swift level where they could re-record all their albums so that they can get a fair deal from their labels or change their name from Prince to a symbol. <laughs> uh, and so that those types of tricks are, are not available to most artists, unfortunately. And so um, they're uh, beyond sort of the lack of competition and sort of the tacit collusion issues in oligopolies. There's also sort of a problem that we see uh, that is fairly stereotypical in consolidated industries, which is just uh, inefficiency, uh, laziness. Uh, there's no one really challenging them to do better. And so even with uh, not-for-profit entities like some of the um, the PROs, uh, the publishing rights organizations, um, they, they could, you know, just be wasteful. Um, there's no one really holding them accountable. Um, they could overpay some people that don't need to be overpaid. Um, they could lose money. They could lose track of who gets what money. Um, and, and no one is really sort of challenging them there um, that could be doing better. And so um, those are sort of the main problems with the industry right now in terms of competition and what's sort of enabling a lot of this black box behavior. Yeah, I'd add that, um, yeah, because there are more artists, they have less power unless they work together, which is increasingly happening. Like, for example, um, I mentioned before, U United Mus Musicians and Allied Workers, they're doing a really great campaign uh, for 100 percent of merchandise sales to be paid to artists instead of venues taking a cut of between 20 and like 50 percent or what what have you. And uh, through that pressure of a bunch of artists working together on venues, they've already made some some big wins um, and they've gotten federal legislation introduced to fix some of these streaming issues. Uh, but there's never been better tools for artists to coordinate as so, well. And that's a that's a threat multiplier. That's more people with more time to do more together. Um, I will just to give some perspective to what we're talking about when we're talking about how big the big three are. Um, so for context, the big three record labels, which are United Music Group or Universal Music Group, Sony Music Entertainment and Warner Music together control 85 percent of the U.S. music catalog by volume, like 85 percent of recorded music in the United States is owned by three companies globally. It's only 74% <laughs> um, around the globe. Okay, this is unimaginable questions of scale. Um, how we got here is like a really interesting question. Um, really up until the aughts, it was, it was not a whole lot better. We went from the big four to the big three, but honestly, really from like the 70s onward through the 2000s was this period of rapid gobbling up of smaller record labels. Um, and so if you work on historical sound recordings, um, you have the problem of often trying to figure out who actually owns the rights to these songs that were recorded in the 60s, 70s, 80s, sometimes even 90s. Like, who bought these labels? Um, the biggest owner of pre-World War II sound recordings is Sony Music, um, and they don't know what they own. Uh, it's at the point at which they will admit if you ask them like, so who, what exactly? And they're like, we have no idea what's in our catalog. Um, like it has just been, you know, consolidation upon consolidation for decades, um, which is how we have gotten this big. Yeah. My, uh, my father was a musician. My mother still gets very small royalty checks and they come from different companies now than who they came from when he cut it in the seventies. It just keeps changing who's signing the, uh, the checks. One of the interesting parts on the competition is that. When you talk to folks in the companies, they talk about how now 
recording artists have more avenues to make money than ever before. Not only do you have live shows and merch, it is easier to license your music, uh, put them up on licensing platforms, uh, soundtrack work, etc. But by the same token, uh, some of the figures I've seen is that streaming is now something like 75% of the money coming into the music industry. So as much as they say, oh, artists can go in all these different directions to make money, it's still this bottleneck of where the money actually is, where the bulk of the money is. And if people are actually going to make livings and keep going for years after years, it's not like a, the Beatles who do residencies in bars in Germany until they're incredible blues musicians. That's gone. It's uh, They've got to have these their, their tentacles out everywhere to make money to actually survive at it. And it's really interesting that some of the arguments that we hear big labels make or some of the actions that they take to sort of like attempt to pass the buck on this reality to other institutions like for example uh several of the biggest labels are suing the internet archive right now for their research library of 78 recordings which are between like 60 plus year old brittle little rec black records um that <laughs> uh that that desperately need to be preserved as as Verita said like sony doesn't even know what that what it owns and yet it's it's suing these nerds for you know the, these nerds and preservationists and librarians who i expect nor respect enormously but i know some of them so i can call them nerds um <laughs> it's a term of respect it's a term of respect especially here yeah, yeah okay. this is this is a place where that's nerds. yeah affectionate. yeah yeah affectionate <laughs> yes dominant oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> yes uh and they're and and they're suing uh, the numbers break down to they're they're suing this nonprofit preservation institution for something like six hundred million dollars in damages for millions of streams. Whereas, like, if you do the math on the Spotify calculators so you can find online or what have you, ten million song streams on Spotify is a payout of twenty one thousand dollars. Uh, music math. The music math is 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 painful and the arguments that i've seen made around this by institutions like the riaa are that well you know this is just napster all over again the internet archive is napster and we have to shut down these research libraries because they're stealing from artists uh but if you like go and you look at the actual like arc of revenue in in the, the music industry you do see like a significant dip when the um you know when everybody was and and music at the majors was like there's no such thing as the internet like, we don't need to put music there um and when they figured out that they needed to uh that started climbing back up and it's now the the, the revenue is highest it's ever been um and and so this argument that 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 you know these these nonprofit researchers and music preservation nerds or anybody but the big record labels and the people that hold all the power in the industry are responsible for the struggles of artists is just patently false and but they can yet they continue to use the struggles of artists as a human shield for uh their own bad practices which is very frustrating and if you are a musician you should come talk to me after because we're doing something yes yeah, so the, to do with the, that the late 90s are this like wild heyday of music industry revenues um party like it's 1999 is like very much a thing in the music industry mm -hmm. that was i think their peak revenue adjusted for inflation of all time um there's a couple of, here's a, just a fun trivia fact that you can pull out uh next time you're talking to music nerds um that was not because the industry was healthy <laughs> that was because they were crazy consolidating uh, they had just started the major push towards compact discs, uh, which led to a lot of people doing repeat purchases of albums they already owned in a new format. Twenty-five uh, cents to make those CDs, including the money to the musicians, and twenty-five dollars to buy them. <laughs> um, it was a huge, huge amount of profit margins, um, and it was absolutely unsustainable. It was an anonymous, like not anonymous, Anomal a, anonymous. A, 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 anonymous. anonymous. A novelist. Anomina. Thank Anomina. you. Anomina. I'm an English major. Um, <laughs> it was an anomalous point, and it was like completely unsustainable that bubble would have popped with or without Napster. Um, yeah. I just want to tag in here with my sort of music nerd and also being old hat on. I, I, I it's honestly fascinating to me that I feel like uh, uh, there's going to be a certain generation that like does not understand the whole music piracy problem because it was solved by streaming. And so, like, 
you know, there's this open question about whether or not streaming was a mistake. I think for music nerds and, and, and people who were big fans, the answer is no. I mean, the, the old model was the only way to discover music was to hear it on the radio, which, by the way, was controlled by consolidated interest about what actually went up there. Or you just have to like blind buy albums. And I would say I was actually one of the people that would go in a record store and just look at the album art and be like, oh, yeah. this fits my vibe. I hope it's a good album. <laughs> Here's my, you know, like $14 allowance that I can buy maybe one album a month on. And so, um, and so, yeah, the internet offered people a, a solution that the industry refused to meet the fans on. Uh, which was the ability to just explore music. And there are like piracy sites that like Trent Reznor eventually admitted being like one of the biggest fans of one of the piracy sites because there was just so much independent music on it that like he could just discover so much stuff he'd never heard before. And now with streaming, that was literally like what the consumers were demanding. Uh, that problem was solved. We've kind of solved for piracy by outcompeting it. But in, in making that transition, we sort of offered all these avenues to to suck up profits and divert them away from artists, which has been a huge shame. Um, the uh, you know I, I I dip into this this area every once in a while, and every time I do, I Google who's making record profits. And uh, I, again, I think of the big threes, most of them have had record profit years in the past two or four years. And that has been the true every time I've Googled that uh, throughout the years. Um, but, you know, as we talked about this panel, like that that number does not seem to be making its way down to the artists. Yeah. And if you were indie, I mean, I'm pulling out of indie games, but indie musicians too, in the mid 90s, people complain about piracy. For us and for my friends who are indie musicians, that was advertising. People pirated our games. If they liked it, they bought it. People pirated the music, they liked it, um, they would buy it then. I remember, um, our lawyer also represents a number of big Grammy Award million unit selling uh, musicians. And he would joke that the difference between our game industry contract and their contract, we actually got the royalties. They didn't. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but it, it's always been this fascinating aspect of how that consolidation stops at the top and the money doesn't flow down out to where it needs to go to create more great work whereas in in games again because even now we talk about steam and uh the, the apple store and the google store controlling the game market we still have more avenues for revenue for real revenue than musicians do there's so many more musicians than there are game developers it's it's a real gatekeeper problem you know there are choke points in the industry and it's you're trading one set of choke points which was radio stations which by the 90s had become a lot less localized and a lot more centralized in their their mm -hmm. playlisting for streaming services um the other thing that is interesting so people talk a lot about like well how do we solve this right we all want to live in a better world um i'm going to try to make this not a panel where we just present a lot of doomsday problems <laughs> and then go goodbye thank you for your time um even though it feels like that many days so there's there's a bunch of different possible solutions that folks all over the ecosystem have been advocating for. Um, one of them is, so the Federal Trade Commission has the authority to do what is called the Section 6B study, which is just a fancy way of saying they basically get to subpoena uh, big players and go, give me your contracts, uh, let me take a look. Now they keep them under seal, so they, won't, they don't release them publicly. These contracts do not become public record. But the FTC can do a deep dive, um, basically in anticipation that they might want to bring uh, like a competition lawsuit or an enforcement lawsuit against uh, a group. So we have been pushing for that for a 6B study, um, which will take multiple years and, you know, eventually come out the other side. Um, the UK just did a parliamentary study about the dysfunction in music streaming. Um, it had two revisions. The original version came out and was actually very aggressive about the major labels and said like here's the choke point and like we have a lot it, they have a lot of concerns about everybody in this ecosystem um but they did specifically finger the major labels as like we're way kind of more worried about you than everybody else <laughs> um the major labels objected and then a revised version was released that walked it way back um so unclear where that's that's gonna go um the other thing that you hear a lot about are what are called user-centric payment models 
Um, and these are in use. I believe Tidal is using them. I think Deezer, which is a French streaming company, has, has made the commitment to start doing it. So to kind of understand um, what, a, what these payment systems look like. So um, the, the current system that most systems use, so Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, et cetera, um, use what's called a pro rata system. So in this model, basically what they do is they toss all the money into one big commingled pool, and then they count up the number of streams that each track gets and figure out like the, you know, the streams are to each artist. They come uh, the number of streams for each artist, and then they divide up that entire pool by the number of streams, and then they pay out per stream to the artists. Now they're going to do the, the cutting up first to the people whose labels they have better deals with. So, you know, Universal, Sony, Warner are going to get a bigger scoop out of that pool first. Um, so a good example of like kind of how this works, just to like, this, these are numbers to help you kind of visualize how this works. So um, imagine that like Matt and I are each paying $10 a month in revenue to a hypothetical streaming service. So that streaming service has got 20 bucks. Um, if I, so I generate a thousand spins. I stream a thousand times in that one month. Um, 500 of those streams are attributable to the Black Mages, uh, and 500 of those streams are attributable to Nickelback. God help me. <laughs> um, Meanwhile, Matt, on the other hand, generates 9,000 streams. Uh, he is a super user spread across 300 different artists. So the streaming service now needs to split all $20 of our revenue among 302 different artists. And it's allocated based on the number of spins. Um, so just, I'm going to save you doing the math. Um, basically, the Black Mages would receive a buck each. Uh, and so the two bands that I listen to would basically receive a buck each, essentially. Um, now, there's a different compensation model that some groups have been experimenting with. Um, which are called user centric. So user centric. Um, or sorry, it, I'm like skip. Sorry, I'm skimming my own very tiny text paper <laughs> on this. Uh -uh. I've just been on sabbatical for three months, and my brain is not mathing. <laughs> um, so under a market share system, yeah, you've got this like a kind of wild upshot. Um, when you've got a user centric model, um, basically, rather than pooling everybody's money into one big pot, they're going to pull my money and Matt's money separately. And so Matt's got 9,000 streams. They're going to take his 10 bucks and divide it among 9,000 streams. They're going to take my 10 bucks and divide it among 1,000 streams that I gave. So that'll end up with $5 to each of my artists. And then Matt, they'll proportion out his 10 bucks among his artists. Um, so some streaming services have been experimenting with this. Um, it does a lot for the, the breakdown of like who this benefits and who it doesn't is like kind of wild. Like the top thousand streamed artists, so like the superstars, like that's like we're talking Drake, you know, uh, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, they earn slightly less under this system. Um, but like streaming or, you know, numbers 1,001 through 10,000 in artist popularity get a significant boost. Um, the group underneath that gets a slightly more modest boost, and the bottom of the pack isn't getting streamed in either case. So they get zero dollars under both of these. Um, it impacts certain uh, genres more than others because certain genres have more super users, like you know Matt, who will listen to ten thousand streams. Um, Hip hop actually ends up earning slightly less money under this model because their listeners tend to be super users and they tend to listen to a lot more music at one go. Country tends to fare a little bit better. It's like kind of wild. Um, so these are out there. The market is playing with them right now. Um, not everybody's super happy about them, because if you're a very big name artist with a high profile, you're going to be making $1 million instead of $1.2 million. Um, and that might make you a little annoyed. But And it's fascinating because as users, we want to be supportive and want to support the artists the best. But keeping an eye on the contract is important. I think most of us do pay some attention. Those who are in this room anyway pay some attention to what the artists are getting. But one thing I've seen more and more is that the more user-friendly apps tend to be the ones that pay the artists the least. And uh, I don't really think they're paying their tech teams that much more than the others. 
but um, the, the Spotify low rates, but I'll admit it. I think they're the, the best of the music apps to use. So um, it's this bizarre dichotomy between where they have focused their efforts, I assume. Um, but for all of us as users, uh, we want people to be able to make livings as artists. We want them to be able to spend eight hours a day practicing, uh, writing music, lying in bed, thinking about music, traveling to the next gig, setting up for the gig, playing the gig. Heading, breaking down from the gig. We want them to be able to do that and still have a house and support a family because that means better music year after year after year. So we as users are in this bizarre place of which of these services do we support, the ones that are easiest for us to use or the ones we have to battle but give um, give the artists the most money. We think title does give uh, the use is the best, but uh, Meredith had a great point before. The folks she knows using it are DJs who are using it professionally or semi-professionally. And the great conversation over here, yeah, I like Tidal, but it, it's charging too much, so I stopped using it. Yeah, I, I <laughs> subscribe to two streaming services. I used to subscribe to three. I didn't drop Tidal. So it's odd for us as users which ones we are going to support. And I love the idea of what Tidal is, but frankly, that's not where the musicians I like the most are. And I think that might be a good segue into talking a little bit about the Make Streaming Pay Act. If that, that sounds good. Um, which is the the legislation that I've alluded to, um, th which uh, or it's their Make Streaming Pay campaign. The, the actual act is called the Living Wage for Musicians Act. Um, and if you want to check out this organization, they are we are Yuma U M A W dot org. Um, and this essentially establishes a one cent per stream streaming royalty as a requirement and also charges an act an, an, a fee on top uh, of every subscription as well as a 10 percent levy levy on um non-subscription revenue from uh for the streamers themselves so if the streamers are running ads or what have you 10 percent of that is levied into would be levied into a fund that then goes to, from the government that goes to make payments directly to musicians and uh there's a lot of precedent for this in music in term i might get this wrong anybody feel free to correct me but like back in the 90s when uh companies were selling blank tapes to uh were selling blank tapes to consumers the like major labels and other asso associated institutions uh fought for a levy on every blank tape sold because a certain amount of them would be like used for piracy or like you know, you, 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 somebody might make their girlfriend a mixtape and not pay. <laughs> scourge, <laughs> <of mixed laughs> scourge of mixtapes. Uh, and so the scourge of mixtapes uh, was used to establish a levy that was then paid, I think, to, to the majors, not directly to artists, uh, and absorbed back into that the the the, the living, partying like it's 1999. Um, this fund is unique because it would take out all of these middlemen and pay uh, pay money directly to artists themselves from the government, which is very similar to other um, other laws. Like there's there's some things in Aust some some laws in Australia that, for example, pay artists uh, pay authors government money for library loans. That has been really useful in helping to make authorship more viable as a career in Australia. Um, some might quibble with the specifics of that law, but, uh, it's still interesting and there's a precedent. Um, and yeah, that, 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 I like that a lot because it puts money directly in the hands of artists, um, and takes a little bit of power away from the majors and, uh, also supports, uh, again more 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 diversity and more working artists versus there's there's a clause in it right now that would cap uh payouts per month so that if you're making a ton of money if you are one of those most popular acts and you don't need it to like put groceries on your table maybe you're not going to get <laughs> you know as, as much money as your streams exactly earn from from the government and instead that's going to go to working class artists which I think is fair. Um, I think it's uh, it's it's pretty greedy for these giant, super successful musicians to quibble over their one point, their their point two of their million per month or whatever it is that they're making when when it's such a hard industry for so many other people coming up. Uh, so I, we're coming sorry. up to the Q and A, uh, or I do want to save time for Q and A. Um, Matt, yeah. I do want to let you yeah. get out what you get out your thoughts. I, I just want to quickly loop back to two things. Uh, 
Maris brought up the 6B study. Um, I should get a shirt printed that says <laughs> I heart 6B studies. I, the, um, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission was envisioned not just as a enforcement body, like a cop on the beat, but also just like an export expert source of information for Congress to be able to do their jobs better and legislate better. And so 6B study is like an invaluable tool for uh, a government agency just like I want to look under the hood at something like an industry doesn't seem to be running right like so that we can just you know is there anything here um and so I think everyone should heart 6p studies <laughs> uh and and just the other thing is just a quick shout out to the video game industry because the uh Tony Hawk That's rare <laughs> Tony Hawk Pro Skater was actually also just a huge yeah. like music discovery tool GTA? when I was a kid. Yeah, GTA, you might just like GTA the game, but man, people found music. People people found music that yeah, way. it's it's like where I learned that Ring of Fire was a good song. I <laughs> never heard hey. of Johnny Cash before as a kid. Yeah, radio. Yeah. yeah, you want your old stuff. Oh man, the peop reason people listen to classical now, you see, for my generation, Bugs Bunny. Now you listen because of video games. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, people, kids would not be finding it. The fact that sea shanties got hot <laughs> purely because of a Sansa's Creed doing a pirate game. And suddenly sea shanties are everywhere. So, awesome. yeah. Great. So uh, we want to leave some time for Q&A. Um, if you've got Qs, hopefully we can have some As. Um, and I know we've, we've kept this pretty high level. So if you've got a question, please feel free to just like hop up to the mic. Otherwise, I will just continue talking forever. And yep. you don't want that. Grab the mic. Me. Grab the mic. Line up. Line up. Okay. You got to do it in the song. You got to sing it. I, I, oh, my God. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Excuse me. I feel like you all answered this, but I'm still unclear. Uh, Spotify has end of the year, like, wrapped, mm -hmm. where it gives you the summary of everything. So me and my young daughter both have Spotify. At the end of the year, I've listened to 2,000 songs. At the end of the year, she's listened to literally like hundreds of thousands of minutes of songs. Super user. I'm always curious if one of those two listening habits results in someone having to pay more money or if she's if Spotify's making less money or something because she's over listening. Yeah, so actually she's driving down our payouts right now. Um, super users because it's adding more streams that they then have to divide all the money among. Um, this is like the thing with the subscription model is it's you can it's an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? You pay one flat fee and then you eat as much as you want. But even though you're paying one flat fee, Spotify is still having to divide that by every single thing that you eat. Okay. Um, and so the end result is that like super users do drive down the average payments for folks. Um, and that's one of the things that like user-centric payments are supposed to address. Um, and the idea being like, you know, there are some fans who really only listen to like two or three bands. Like, I will go through months where I just listen to Godspeed, You Black Emperor. Um, you probably don't want to talk to me on those months. <laughs> um, but in that case, like, the, the rationale is all my money should go to Godspeed then. Uh, yeah. You know, and so that's, that's the short answer. Thank you. The real answer is still go to live shows and buy merch. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, over the years, there's been a lot of changes in the last two decades of music delivery with streaming coming from piracy coming from not the internet. Do you think that streaming is like an end game for music delivery? Or do you think we're going to see more delivery mechanisms come up come about in the future? Oh, there are so many delivery mechanisms happening right now. I mean, all my friends who do um, uh, VTubers, all my VTubers putting virtual reality, the virtual reality music parties right now where DJs are rocking it and making bank. I know DJs who can make more money doing virtual parties than they make at live one. Uh, and and they're geez, they make money in real live ones as well. Fortnite, Fortnite considers was the biggest place for live events during the pandemic. And they paid the artists who were there very nicely. And Tim Sweeney and the gang at Epic are still looking for ways to make that happen. I mean, admittedly, Sad to say they laid off some of the main people for that in their only round of layoffs they've ever done, but they are still looking on how does that become the event space. If you look at folks who are developing islands right now using UEFN, music is a key part of what they're looking to do within those islands. So if you want to see where kids are, and Roblox, oh my God, the music parties in Roblox right now with artists setting up their own places in Roblox to make money off of their music. Yeah, the, the number of places where innovative artists can do cool things. Yeah, we're about to see a whole new level of things coming out. I, I, oh, I just wanted to add on that. I, I 
would like to see a return to uh, music ownership as a piece of the pie. Mm-hmm. Um, I know vinyl's coming back. I'm I'm one of those hipsters that engages <laughs> in that. I think that as a fan, it like allows us to express our uh, appreciation of a particular album and hopefully give more money to the artist. I think that like as a fan, it would be good to know that there are avenues to uh, make sure that the 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 thing that we are using to express our our fandom is giving the most money to the artist. And so for me, I feel like vinyl is probably the best shot I got. But you know, if there were more options there, that'd be fantastic. So if you're local, Wuck Street, Waxton Facts, Elegroo, <laughs> make sure you're hitting all of the all the record stores. <laughs> Uh, yeah, or yeah, buying directly from artists at shows is really great too because there is no there's no middleman. But supporting local independent record stores is also an amazing thing to do. Um, yeah, and I would also say that like with seeing you, uh, the UMG TikTok spat and the removal of music from that platform, and if you um, look into this is super nerdy, but like the the movement for DVD ownership and what mm-hmm. have you. Uh, there's also like a real risk of like loss and, 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 um, and having music erase or cease to be on these platforms, depending on what's either going on with the artists, what's going on with the label, who the, who, who the streaming platform is beefing with that week, or, or ultimately perhaps they decide and, you know, Spotify decided, um, uh, Daniel Eek made all this money, the Spotify CEO, right after uh, Spotify decided to stop paying artists to get less than 100 streams in their songs. Uh, Spotify may eventually decide to remove all songs that have less than 100 str- uh, or, or less than 1,000 streams, less than 1,000 streams, or to um, uh, otherwise make changes that uh, censor or deplatform. Um, there's a big problem for artists with their like algorithms misidentifying their music as uh as as stolen or something they don't have the rights to um and purging it from spotify without a lot of transparency or much of an appeal process and so there that that's an important reminder whenever you are you are licensing you are streaming is that you don't actually own it and if that's one of your favorite songs you might want to have it in a format that you control yeah, that's been the one silver lining of the like HBO Max debacle where they've just been like memory holding so much stuff is that it really does drive home like it's one of the risks of a subscription based economy model for anything is the preservation risks. Um, you just you don't own it. You're paying for a pass to be able to it's like a theme park. You're, you're paying for a pass to be able to walk in and get whatever they're going to give you that day. Um, and you don't get to take the roller coaster home. Yeah, and and I would also say that like streaming has significant environmental impacts too in terms of the de- the the consumption of constantly restreaming over and over again to our devices, and that's something that we're gonna have to grapple with too. Yep. And uh, this isn't a DMCA panel, but if you're an artist and someone sends you a takedown against your own work, fight that one, fight that one, fight that one. I had to fight with Warner for way too long, and finally got it taken care of. But it was always worthwhile. Thank you. Hi. Um, you've already uh, given a lot of examples of you attacking the problem from the regulation side and also the artist empowerment side. Um, do you think that you know over time and successes on those fronts, that's sufficient to kind of fix this, these issues? Or do you think that if you had a magic wand and could like destroy record labels, uh, would that be a better path, if so, that makes sense? Yeah. <laughs> We're all like, like yeah, and Send your complaints to Mitch at RIAA.org. Um, that's Mitch Glazier. He's the head of the RIAA. Um, yeah, so I mean, at the end of the day, markets are going to do the thing that is most rational for the people involved in it. And right now, the most rational thing for the biggest players in the market to do is to screw over everybody on either end because they don't answer to anyone. And right now, there's no regulatory hammers to bring down on them. Um, and we're not going to get them to behave in a way that I think we think is socially beneficial until those regulatory hammers start coming down. And the regulatory hammers are still going to be playing whack-a-mole because some other uh, yeah. Yeah. entities... We're going to have a great new distribution them. method that I, they're going to have to deal with. I think it definitely wouldn't make the world worse if we broke up or unwound a lot of some consolidation that happened. Um, it, it is a kind of obscene and the arguments that they got away with to allow that to happen were very silly. And I'm really hopeful too for like artist-owned platforms in the future, like co-op 
sort of models. I, I, I know that there are a lot of really big promises made during the, the, the NFT bubble and what have you about what that technology could end up doing for artists and ownership. Uh, but the conversations that were happening there, if not necessarily the technology itself at this time, were, I think, really inspiring and important and pointing towards a, a potential future where, like I said, artists have more ability than ever before to organize and coordinate together and the potential for them to just say, well, like, you all suck <laughs> and we're done and we're taking our art and we're going to the thing that we own and govern as creators together uh is something that i might get to live to see which i would i would absolutely love that and uh and i do love the music cool. <laughs> sorry no i'm just i'm i'm i'm, I'm blethering on about we have, how much i would love to see that so we how got, much i want to support artists that are we got that. four minutes yeah, left before we got to yeah. get out of here so stop blithering thank you thank i you. love the musicians who have their own discord community so if you, you have a musician you like invite the discord community join um, can you talk at all about where in this whole ecosystem of, you know, ownership, streaming, um, digital delivery, where does Bandcamp fit into all that? So Bandcamp is really interesting. I think Leah can probably talk more directly. I think, I suspect you know much more about this in depth than I do, um, but they do direct deals with their artists. And so the money doesn't pass through like intermediary distributors, I don't think. There are um, some distributors who do put artists on there. Right, but it's not, you're not, you're necessarily not going through the major label, like the black box that the major labels present. Yeah. And you're also not dealing with the weird incentives that Spotify has, so. Yeah, that was a pretty good summary. My, my musician friends Rock much prefer getting their stuff sold through Bandcamp. Yeah, get on Bandcamp yeah. if you can. Yeah, yeah no, because anytime I see a musician, you know, specify a preferred platform, it usually tends to be Bandcamp. Yep. Yeah, totally. They get more money. So if yeah. you want to buy music from artists and it's digital files or whatever, um, you buy from Bandcamp. Go Bandcamp. Thank you. Uh, when talking about the pro rata model versus the user centric model, I feel like in a, uh, like, if there's a wide adoption of a user-centric model, what you'll see is uh, pressures for hyper users to spend more to use more, which will look less convenient for users. And like it, it it'll become like it'll grow to maybe like five percent of the market, and then it won't be able to go past that because. Yeah, the thing about user-centric models is it's actually kind of the middle ground between streaming and just a la carte, like yeah. back when we had to buy 99-cent mm -hmm. MP3s from the Apple Store, mm -hmm. um, which was healthier in a lot of ways for, or at least I put it this way, it's healthier in part because it's what the industry was built on, mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we framed the payments around. Um, but yeah, this is this is a really interesting point. So like I describe the work that we do at Public Knowledge as consumer advocacy, um, but also sometimes public interest. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of those fields where those two terms can occasionally come into tension with each other. Mm -hmm. Because from I went to the University of Chicago, forgive me. Um, mm -hmm. But there's this there's this idea that like consumers benefit when they pay less money mm -hmm. to get stuff. The more they get for the less money, the better off consumers are. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's great, except when it starts to impact the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And that works up until the point at which people can no longer afford to make music anymore mm -hmm. and to continue to create and generate art that then consumers can. So you don't want to collapse the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of those things where like, yeah, I think like I refuse to use Xbox Game Pass because mm -hmm. I've worked so much on music streaming that I'm like, I know where this is going and you can't fool me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think I think at the end of the day, music is going to get a little more expensive once we start to course correct. But, you know. Probably not, hopefully not to the point where it, you know, notably dings the market. Well, that's a fascinating analogy because there's so much money in Xbox Game Pass right now. There's a reason why most of the studios who Microsoft is supporting are spending no less than $50 million on each title because there is so much money in Game Pass right now. Right. I do think that, like, the user citric model is a little bit more respectful for fans, too, because, like, if you are... Uh, a super fan of one band, and that is all you listen yeah. to, then they're getting your money every month, or yeah. two bands or three bands. Oh, I think that an interesting middle space is happening on Twitch. Uh, if you have Twitch Prime, you can, th there's money that you pay to Twitch Prime, but you can also subscribe yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, tip directly. Yeah. Great. 
And I know we're technically at time, but let's speed run. Last question. Yes. Um, I was just curious what your thoughts are in the role of generative AI in the music oh, industry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, it's supposed to be the best one. I know. And yeah, if, yeah. if you foresee any uh, impact. I'll give you my short answer, but Larry yeah. and Jihad. <laughs> thank you for coming uh, yeah no we can talk afterwards but that's a complicated one um, so thank you everybody for coming please rate us in the app if you liked it if you didn't like us please, there's no rating function uh, yeah thank you for coming and if you want to read uh, an entire like you know 60 pages of light beach reading about this this is the QR code on the back that'll let you download the paper that just came out in the Berkeley Journal of Entertainment and Sports Law that I literally just wrote about also we have stickers and zines up here right, stickers yeah very nice stickers I have glitter possum stickers yeah, come come here no it will not hack uh, you.